So my process starts uh, for any of these images, uh, honestly, most images that I work on nowadays, uh, where I will kind of start by doing studies. Uh, so these are actually compositional studies that I'm working on currently of various artists that I really like. This current one is uh, Chase Stone. Um, and when I try and do these compositional studies, I try and stick to primarily three values or three tones. This is something that I kind of picked up from uh, learning from the Loomis books. I believe it was Creative Illustration that talked about this. Although I think Loomis in his book uh, recommends four tones. Um, some people actually do this type of studying uh, or research into compositions and they only use black and white um, or just two tones. Um, I think anything like this, any simplification of value to really learn or nail down a composition is just beneficial. Like it's helped me so much in planning really clear, precise uh, images. Um, and so I always like to start any sort of uh, illustration or project or whatever that I'm working on with some sort of studying like this. Um, it doesn't just have to be compositional studies. It's kind of it's kind of just whatever I think that I need to work on um, when it comes to illustrations. And so around this time, I was doing just a lot of uh, drawing studies on my own um, and uh, was feeling pretty confident with my drawing skills at the time, but I was not feeling confident with like really strong, bold compositions. So I wanted to work on these. I usually work on these for anywhere from 30 to 60 minutes. And that's why you can see the timer on the right there, because I wanted to show you guys the actual like time that it's taking me to do all of these uh, different little thumbnail images. And so uh, I think so far, I think the timer was initially set at uh, an hour. And so each one of these is taking me anywhere from like, you know, five to 10 minutes. It kind of depends. Sometimes I get interrupted when working on these studies because I do it in the morning and like, you know, my dog needs to go out or uh, my, my wife asked me to help her with something or anything like that can um, kind of cause me to step away for a sec. So, but I try and set the timer so that I stay like uh, not distracted. Basically, I, uh, it, I'm so much less likely to go and browse the internet if I know that like I'm being timed. Um, and it's also so that I don't end up um, working on the same thing for too long or dilly dallying or anything like that. Um, and so I know if I don't have a timer, um, other than like getting distracted on the internet, what I can really uh, get caught up doing is I'll just work on the thing for a long time um, or I'll take my time with it because, uh, you know, there's no, there's no pressure, right? But if I've got a whole schedule of things that I've got to get through in the day, um, the only way I'm going to be able to do all these things that I'm set, setting myself to, to do is if I am very on task and I stay uh, punctual with everything. So um, going through some of these, uh, a lot of these are league splash, uh, splash images because I'm working on smite splash images. Um, and so league, I mean, I've now been working with Riot for the last, oh gosh, um, been working with them for maybe over a year now, uh, I think. And um, their, uh, their system of art direction is so heavy. It's so much heavier than I'd ever worked with before. And um, they're very adamant on making sure that the image is as good in their eyes as possible. And so taking a look at some of these images that have been developed for them, like you're going to see like the best of the best. Um, there's some things that are client specific and not just like a quote unquote, like good thing. And you have to be very aware of that. Um, so like, for instance, a huge thing with splash images is there's always some drastic perspective, you know, like something's flying at the camera, like in this, I'm sorry, I'm not a league player. I don't know uh, her, her name. I know she's part of Freljord. I think that's all I got, but I'm learning. Um, but you see like that weapon that she has is like flying towards us all dramatically and it changes the perspective drastically. Um, that's not like a good or a bad thing. That's something that can make an image look like dynamic 
in a way, but it's not necessarily something that would make or break an image just because you don't have that. And you can see in this example here by Jennifer Wusling, like this image, it doesn't have as drastic of that perspective change. Um, it has some pretty drastic perspective changes, but it's not like as crazy as some other splash arts have been. I think the one below this one is the same, same type of deal. And uh, Smite, for instance, it's taken me, you know, it took me a long time to, to figure out like what exactly do they want in their images um, that I'm learning from because I'm studying League of Legends images. Um, but what does Smite specifically as a client like to see? Um, so now you, you can see I'm starting to actually thumbnail out my own. I usually start with a drawing. Um, some, some artists will start with shapes. Uh, they try to get those shapes down. I really think that it is entirely preference. A anything that I do here, I will never ever say like, this is the right way of doing it. Everything comes down to preference and what you're comfortable with. Um, <clears throat> the more jobs that I work on, the more that I realize that it doesn't matter whether you start with shape, it doesn't matter whether you start with line um, or anything. Um, no matter what you start with, as long as what you are developing has a good foundation in some way, whether that foundation is in silhouette or drawing or value grouping, um, there has to be something that can carry the image. And you'll see this a lot in that there's artists that they will specialize in a particular thing and that you'll see artists that maybe they don't have the greatest drawing skills but the way that they use color is like incredible. And just the way they use color can carry an image because it's like so freaking cool and it's so unique the way they do it. And you can see the same thing with how people, you know, maybe their drawing skills aren't as good, but their values are great. Maybe their uh, drawing skills uh, are great, but like the values aren't as good. Um, ideally you wanna be as good at everything as possible, but if you have something that you lean towards, I think making sure that that one thing that you lean on is like as good as it can possibly be, I think that alone can carry an image and make people forget about, you know, any other sort of things that look off. So you can see that with a lot of league splash art, right? Is that you can see that a lot of league artists are very, very, very good um, drawers. They, they uh, just know exactly how to stylize the anatomy and the perspective is usually just right. And then sometimes, you know, they can, like, it's not often, I think, because of their, um, their rigid, uh, like, art direction, trying to make sure that everything is as good as it po can possibly be. But, you know, you can sometimes see, like, values getting a little chaotic or colors maybe looking like a little bland and not as much pop as they could have um but it doesn't matter because like something always carries it right whether it's the drawing or the values or the color so i'm applying what i learned from from my compositional studies onto these thumbnails that i'm doing uh, i should have set a timer next to this one each one of these thumbnails takes me anywhere from like 10 to 15 minutes um i try to be really quick and rough with it but at the same time I'm also trying to like not worry about it because if I go into these thumbnails this is a pretty crucial stage right making sure that I am putting my all into this early stage because if I'm half-assing this portion of the image I think it's going to show through in the final I have to really enjoy this process of working on this stage which is why like here i got the gist of the image from before but i realized that sylvanas the character was a little bit uh small or sorry he was too large um and so i went back to the previous thumbnail and i adjusted that i don't think that's something the client would have pointed out but that's just something that like i saw and it bothered me and i wanted to go back and do a good job so I really have to make sure that um, I am enjoying the process while thumbnailing. Because if I'm not enjoying it, then like that's going to read through in the final image. 
Um, I don't know if you'll uh, see it here, but I know a lot of the times I'll start some of these sketches and it, I like I can get a pretty clear idea early on that it's just not working. Like it's just not, it doesn't feel good. It's not something I'm excited about. And so I'll just scrap it. Um, most of the time I try and get some sort of an idea uh, based off of a perspective that's laid out or a pose. And so for this one, I thought that um, Sylvanas's silhouette would be pretty important. Um, and so I, I thought like him kind of pointing out to the big tree monster thing. And I'm sorry, I don't know if the tree monster Sylvanas or if the guy is Sylvanas. I, 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 sorry. Um, sorry, Smite fans. But uh, so I wanted him to kind of be like pointing out and really standing out and, and popping out and taking up one portion of the image in that first third and then the tree monster on the second third um, basically so that it's divided and there's a nice like rule of thirds contrasting balance there and focal points. Um, I thought something like that could be kind of cool. But there's plenty of times that like I have an idea for a pose or I lay a perspective in and then I start drawing and it's just not it's like not working out what I imagined it would and so sometimes I'll redo it and see like okay maybe this is how I could get it to work if I adjust this ever so slightly um but sometimes I'll just scrap it and, and I'll think of something else but I'm always trying to stay like fresh I'm always trying to like kind of keep my brain going and not going into autopilot I think if I start going into autopilot mode that's when things start to get a little like Bleh, and that's when I start losing that like motivation to continue working on it. And that's when I feel like I have to either scrap it or I have to move on. Um, so this is the fourth, uh, fourth one that I'm working on. I always try to send at least four thumbnails to a client. Um, it's not like something I do for every client. I think it's just something for Smite that I got into the habit of doing and then I didn't want to break that habit with them. There's plenty of times that I've only sent them two thumbnails or three thumbnails. Um, I always try to give them variety because I, I try to put myself in the client's shoes and I know that variety is is kind of nice and it helps if like, I, I never want it to happen where I'll send thumbnails to a client and then they'll just say like, N none of these work. Like n none of these are what we were imagining. Um, so you see a nice silhouette pop there for Sylvanas just to have him like really pop and stand out uh, against that light. So that's what I was thinking about for this one. So I wasn't able to save the progress of the colored, uh, the colored process. Unfortunately, I, I forgot to hit record on this, so I'm sorry. Uh, this is the color thumbnail that I ended up sending in. So they approved this particular black and white thumbnail. And then um, after, after that, I then will develop a color thumb. So I, uh, I wanted this to be like sort of gray and depressing. This is supposed to be like this World War I based skin. So like I thought like the aftermath of this big battle and the, like these woods just being like decrepit. And so wanted a lot of muted tones, but then wanted the fire on the tree monster to like really pop. Um, and I wanted the color pops that I wanted were the uh, embers on the tree monster, the um, the eyes, and then the goggles of the character. Um, now the problem that I had with this particular image, and you know, you'll you'll just have this, you'll just run into this a lot of the times when working on client work, is that the colors in these designs weren't very harmonious. Um, so the eyes of the tree monster and like the goggles of the character, as well as just the various colors between the two. Um, like the closest thing that I think you could kind of get would be like a, like a square color scheme and that you're going to have like this blue, uh, red, yellow, green type thing. And that can be okay, um, but it's not, it's not ideal. And even that can be a little like hectic. And so when you're in that situation, if you can't find particular colors to work, then that's where you have to go back to what I was saying earlier and that something has to carry the image. And so if it can't be the colors, right, if the colors aren't like in this beautiful harmonious way and that's just a limitation that you have due to the designs that you're given. Um, and this is not knocking the concept artist by any means. I'm not meaning to say that. I'm just saying that like for an illustration, this became difficult for me to like make these colors work 
harmoniously together. Um, but if that's the case and you have these limitations, then at that point I have to think like, okay, how are the values going to help pop this image? How is the drawing going to make this image work? Um, and that's then the, the step that I go to. So I sent this color thumbnail off to them. Uh, I believe this was the one that they um, they approved with a caveat and that and that was that I think they wanted the fires to pop a little bit more in the background. Um, and so uh, what I decided to do is I will, uh, I'll, and I do this often, is I'll adjust the some feedback later on. So um, instead of making that adjustment and then sending an update to them in order to save time, because a lot of these freelance gigs are on a pretty short timeline, I think most of these images I ended up having about um, anywhere from two to four weeks to work on them. But when I'm having to balance out doing, you know, like three magic illustrations, uh, or, uh, you know, some designs for another company or maybe other illustrations for someone else, I'd be bouncing around anywhere from three to five clients at any given time. And so in order to save time, I just go on to the next step, um, and then make those color adjustments when the time comes. So at this point I'm working on the drawing. Um, I, uh, I, I'd say if I made any sort of a mistake here, it's that I, um, was going off of the thumbnails structure and I was not really thinking too deeply about the actual structure in the thumbnail. Now this can be a good or a bad thing in that the thumbnail is where you're going to get a lot of the energy. Um, that's where you're going to get a lot of like that good feel like that's what attracted you to the image in the first place, right? So I want to maintain as much of that energy as possible. And if some of that energy is a little bit anatomy breaking, I'm okay with that. I think that's fine. But if it's too anatomy breaking and I don't notice it right away because I'm not blocking in that structure, I'm not doing the skeleton, you know, where I'm, I'm planning everything out and making sure that once I put clothes on this body, it's going to, you know, realistically fit. Then later on, I'm going to have to go back and fix my mistakes. And that ends up happening later in this. I have to go back and I think I adjust his like torso and his legs or something like that. So, in this line stage, this would be the next step in my process. My process as a whole is, um, see, this is me. This is me fixing the anatomy, but I fixed it at the thumbnail level and then drew on top of that, which I think is a smart, smart choice. Um, it's easier that way. Um, my process as a whole would be uh, thumbnailing and then it goes into a color thumb where I make sure that I plan out the colors well and that they'll look good in the end, um, as good as they can possibly be at least. And then I'll go into a final line drawing where I will correct any mistakes that I might see coming up in the thumbnail stage. And I think that back leg ends up changing a few times. Uh, I know the front leg ends up changing. And, it, and again, this is just an issue of, I did not plan out the underlying structure of this person before I started working on the drawing. I'm going purely off of the energy from the thumbnail. And that was, that was a mistake on my part. And um, this was actually recorded quite a while ago. I think um, it's just taken me a while to get it because I wanted to finish the beginner's guide tutorials that I worked on. And I promised that um, before I would uh, tell anybody on, on YouTube that the beginner's guide tutorials are done and I advertise that, I want to make sure that at least one, one lengthy free tutorial goes onto YouTube for everybody for supporting me on there. Um, but this was actually recorded um, I want to say July of last year, um, and it's just taken me a while to finally sit down, get a solid, consistent audio recording going of it. And so since working on this, I, I've worked on a lot, a lot of Riot images, and uh, I've learned a lot from working on those, um, from the art direction that I've been receiving from them, um, to the, the studio I've been working with has uh, taught me a lot. Um, it's um it's really forced me to take a step back and reevaluate my um not necessarily my process because i'm going with the same process but it's making me uh kind of second guess more of my decisions and i don't want to say necessarily in a bad way um 
but it's much more meticulous. And so there's there's probably, I think there's quite a few things that if I were to go back and work on this now, I would, I would adjust, um, not just with how I handled the drawing um, and the shapes, uh, but even the rendering, how I handled the rendering, I think um, was, I, I could have done it a little bit, a little bit smoother. I could have given the background some more attention in the end, but um, I'll, uh, I'll comment on that when we, when we get to it. Uh, most of the time when I work on these line drawing stages too, I tend to work kind of on, um, on one layer, or if there's something that I think is really going to be um, an issue in the end, uh, there's just like two major overlapping forms, then, you know, then I might work uh, on some lines on a, on a separate layer, but uh, because these lines are, you know, it, when I'm working on, on this line drawing, I'm working on what I'm going to be seeing um, with lines alone, right? And so if I were to work on underlying lines, like if I were to work on you know, that tree stump behind the primary figure, uh, that's not going to be seen, right? And so I need to make sure that those lines that are visible in this are what are actually going to be flowing well with everything. So there's a common issue that a lot of artists will have where when, when they do what I'm doing, where they work on all the lines on the same, on the same layer and there's overlapping forms, um, those forms will sort of stop interacting, like they, they'll avoid any amount of foreshortening. Um, so they won't have uh, lines intersecting with particular forms. Um, and what ends up happening is because you start to stray away from that, this happens when you paint on the same layer as well, is that uh, you'll get this like smooth little area around a form because you didn't want to you didn't want to paint past it right um and so it's a fine line it's like i want to make sure that my lines look good how they are but in order for them to look good they have to look as if they're going past the form <laughs> um but uh, also while going past the form they can't be causing any tangents and so that's why i tend to do it all on one layer so that i can i can see those tangents uh, ahead of time and even then i think a couple still still kind of crept in none that really drive me nuts i don't think but but it is what it is um and you can tell from the concepts there that i have on the right those were the the um concepts that i was sent uh in the brief i'm i'm straying away quite a bit from the uh the trees initial concept and um it, luckily because the concept is so <clears throat> it's so like broken up and so like haphazard with the wood. Um, I can sort of get my own design shapes in there. I can move the wood around however I want that I think like would look cool and have the form stand out. And uh, luckily the client is more than okay with that. I'd say the difference between working with uh, Smite versus working with uh, Riot um, and potentially other other um, companies that require splash art is just that um, Smite uh, wasn't as big into stylizing, stylization. Um, I would, most of the time when I tried stylizing faces, uh, they, they ended up wanting to uh, tone it back and in the final that was shipped, they would uh, kind of do this realistic pass on top of it. Um, but I was able to get away with stylization sometimes. So you could see like how I handled the wooden arms and stuff, how I just had these like massive, like really strong, solid shapes poking out. Um, uh, that is, it's clearly not realistic, the way the roots are handled, the way all this stuff is, is handled. But um, uh, I guess they, they thought it looked good enough because I did not get any complaints about that. So this is me lasso tooling as well as pen tooling uh, the outer edges. Um, of each form um and so uh i tend to do this because it's very very difficult to um tell if lines are going to work just from the line stage it uh i i really do think that it's it's kind of a skill all on its own to be able to tell if uh lines are lines are working without having any sort of painted forms in there um so uh, i believe i actually just uh, 
skipped ahead, but I think um, I think the lines were approved that I just wrapped around, and now I'm starting to block in the uh, the color changes. So this is where I would adjust the colors from what uh, was initially um, what was initially given to them. They wanted more more heavy oranges in there, more green mist too, because that's what this character does is they emit this like green foggy poison stuff. This skin specifically, at least. Um, and what I tend to do to save time is uh, I have the line layer open at the moment, <clears throat> and uh, I uh, I just took the um, silhouetted forms that I'd already lasso tooled, and uh, I uh, took that selection and just copied and pasted the um, the color thumbs uh, colors into that form. And so that way I don't have to block it all in, like all those colors are as genuine as the initial uh, thumbnail. You have to you have to constantly be thinking about, you know, where are the values at, where are the colors at, how is the drawing looking? Um, I think a huge problem that I had, and I see a lot of other people have, um, is that uh, they will handle these stages very, very strictly. Um, which I think that's what everyone wants, right? Everyone wants to just be able to work on the color thumb and then that's it. The colors don't need to change. The colors are perfect at this color thumbnail, so nothing's gonna change. And same with the drawing, right? You work on the drawing and then boom, mm, perfection. Don't need to change the drawing. And the problem is that as, as easy as it is to be able to just tell yourself like, okay, great, I don't have to think about the drawing anymore. Like the drawing is taken care of. You're shutting a side of your brain off that you may need on because as much as you would like to, you know, hope that the drawing is done, maybe, you know, as you start painting, you're starting to realize something. Maybe you're seeing some tangents you didn't notice. Maybe the proportions are off. Maybe, maybe the foreshortening is looking a little meh, you know? Um, there's there's a lot that you could still think about and adjust um, and uh, if there's one thing that I think honestly has uh, been a consistent change the uh, the more I've gotten into doing freelance work the more I've developed my own skills as an artist uh, has been that I think one thing that really has made me much more efficient and I've noticed it in other artists I think uh, efficiency in other artists um, it's almost like the the um, openness to be able to say fuck it the openness to be able to scrap something and just like start anew or you know I remember early on starting out and if I noticed like an arm looked kind of wonky like one I'd be in denial I'd say like, no, no, the arm is fine. Like the arm is fine. I don't need to change it. But also if I ended up changing it, it would take me like, you know, three hours to do it. Um, which came down to me not knowing enough about the fundamentals. So if it was drawing, I didn't know enough about like the anatomy or the perspective or how to block that in. But also because I was in so much denial, I would work on it for two hours and I'd try and like render, you know, I'd try and polish a turd basically and then finally have to come to terms with it and say like, oh, okay, no, I just need to start it over again. And now if I notice something like, and I think it's a, I think it's a big enough deal. I no questions asked, like I scrap it, I'll erase it. I mean, I, I think you might even see it later on in this video. Um, like I said, the, I think I adjust his legs and I adjust a few things later on. Um, and it's just because I opened the file up uh, one morning and I saw that it was looking off and so just decided like all right I'm gonna erase it I'm gonna I'm gonna fix it um, and I think being really open to noticing those things and being open to changing them uh, willingly I honestly think that's something that makes you much much faster because th like the sooner you can get an accurate drawing uh, an accurate placement of values, an accurate, you know, whatever it is in front of you, um, the sooner you can be to, to finishing something. You know, there's something to be said in that uh, if a drawing is 
is solid, you know, like I like I keep saying, it will carry um, the image. But if a drawing is not solid, the values aren't solid, the colors aren't solid, perspective, composition, whatever, um, the image will always feel off. And so you can't shy away from making those those big, big changes to any image. So this is me adjusting the stupid foot. <laughs> um, when recording this process, it was really good, good for me to identify how long these images take me as well, which they vary. They always vary depending on, on the project. Um, but I was surprised to see that um, I'd been telling a lot of people that, you know, I think these images, they usually take me anywhere from, you know, 20, 20 to 30 hours. Um, this image only took me about 12 hours um, in the end. Uh, like I said, I think there's, it, if this were, if this were something I'd be doing now, where my, where my headspace is currently at with, with work, um, I, I think I would spend another few hours, um, working on it. I would, and I think, again, it's that, it's that openness, right? I was even back here, this was, you know, last July, uh, I still had a good level of openness of, of willingness to make adjustments and change things. But in comparison to how I am now, <laughs> oh no, oh, I, I will, um, I will try to be incredibly observant of my own stuff. And if something's not right, I, I try and change it. Um, if it, if it takes another hour, you know, then, then so be it, but hopefully it will look better in the end and the client will be more happy with it. Um, now if it's my own stuff, then whatever. <laughs> if it's my own stuff, that's, that's my deal. I can accept if, you know, something I, I make is, is not great for myself or not as good as it could be for myself. But if someone's paying me money to work on something, I think it's my job to do, do the best I can. Um, oh, this is a, uh, paint over that was sent to me by, uh, by the client, by high res. Um, cause they wanted even more pop from the, uh, from the wooded area, more, more orange in the image. So there I am, uh, adding that in and that's me flipping between values, making sure that, uh, this giant new, you know, splash of color and light isn't going to mess with my initial value structure that I had, um, which uh, I had to adjust slightly. So I have this like warm glow coming in from behind now, um, which I'm okay with as long as the character still pops. So this is me adjusting the leg finally, um, where uh, I moved it up uh, and moved it forward. Uh, it was like being bent too much and it was like too curvy and weird and and his silhouette wasn't popping enough um and so uh yeah so i ended up moving that forward i think it i think it helps the silhouette pop quite a bit um and it was you know it's like i said it's like it was it was nothing you know this didn't end up taking me too much time to to make that adjustment um but with the value structure you know i when i say i want to maintain it it's not about keeping those same exact values. It's about making sure that those value groupings are maintained. So if there's a grouping of shadow, mid-tone, um, or, or sorry, we could say dark, uh, light, uh, and, and mid-tone, um, I wanna make sure that I don't deviate from that, right? Um, which is why, you know, I have these helmets on both of them pop with their values. Even, even in their shadows, they are as light as the mid-tone range, um, right? The values are similar to um, the, uh, the big tree guy, right? Um, except for the area that's being hit with light. That's supposed to be the pop. That's the one really light uh, pop um, surrounded by all of this mid-tone and, and dark. And that's the thing that I think attracted me to, you know, sending, sending this thumbnail with the batch of thumbnails because I, I liked that. Um, so you can see I'm kind of blocking in some background stuff too. Now I'm starting to get some like forms, some trees and fire and stuff 
trying to build that fire up even larger from what they uh, what they sent to me. Um, if there's one thing that I'd probably do differently uh, now, uh, now that some time has passed since working on this image, is uh, I, I enjoy working uh, on the same layer because I think when you work on the same layer for long enough, you start being unafraid. You, you, I think it all comes back down to that willingness of um, adjusting the image, um, even after you've worked on it, you know. Uh, when you work on one layer, like, you have to be open to it. You know, these guys are disconnected. So I have the this character, and I have the tree guy, and then I've just got the background. So basically three layers. And within those three layers, there's, like, some, you know, attached layers where I'm making adjustments or trying out, you know, like, overlays or color layers or soft light or whatever. But uh, most of the time, I'll just I'll flatten it at some point. Um... So it's uh, I like I like working on the same layer because I think that's what's made me so open to be able to to change things on a, on a whim, um, which I think has just made me more efficient. It's um, it's uh, it's made me I think work much much faster. Um, but that being said, uh, I do think uh, I've been working a lot with. Um, with multiple layers, I've been working a lot lately with lasso tooling selections, um, and I think that it actually has been um, faster. I do some sort of a combination where I will lasso tool selections, but I'll keep everything on the same layer. Um, but doing that has um, increased, I think, my my speed um, by by quite a bit, uh, and I enjoy working that way, and so. I think that's what I would do differently. You'll see here that like I'll be painting on this guy and you know his whole all of it is all in one layer. Um and uh what that ends up forcing me to do is if I want to do a large brush stroke, you know, a big, you know, swath of shadow or of color, um then I might have to paint back over a certain selection that I did um previously. Uh, but with the uh, lasso tooling method I've been doing lately, it's uh, it it doesn't uh, it doesn't require me to to do that. Hey, you watching this video? I don't have sponsors because I'm not that important. But I do have videos that you can purchase on my Gumroad, ArtStation, and QBrush website store things for five dollars a piece or twenty dollars for the full series. And it's called the Beginner's Guide to Art Fundamentals. F books, am I right? Books are stupid and they're useless. Instead, how about you watch a video where you can listen to my monotone voice talk for hours and hours on end about what you could just read in a better book. Color and light? Yeah, right. Creative illustration? <laughs> More like creative frustration because of all this text, am I right? <laughs> what is this, a... Is this a dictionary? Burn. You could do what I did and learn from people that are far, far better than me by reading their dumb, boring books. Or you could do what I never did by learning from a mediocre person that read those dumb, stupid, boring, boring books and then just compiling that information and probably missing some of it and summarizing it, but then selling it at a much cheaper price. Could I go to jail? So if you sort of like me, please support me by by throwing money in my face. All right, bye. So added in a, I always add in this folder on top of everything that I just call final or finishing touches, um, and uh, ended up dropping a little color dodge pop in there because I thought that looked good. Uh, you can see some references that I have here uh, as well on the side. Um, I, uh, I tend to use references um, if I'm crunched for time uh, or uh, if if there's something very specific to the image um, that I want to make sure that I that I get right um, I think I, I do end up doing a study of, of that image on the right though um, to really get that a uh, that fire, you know, wrapping around the wood feel. 
um, even though this wood, you know, it's tricky working on this type of splash art because you don't just, it's not just about, you know, can I paint wood? Because if I'm working on a magic card, um, they focus very heavily on realism then as long as I make sure that the wood looks like it's a wood texture then that's great that's fine um, but for this if it looks you know exactly like that photo on the right it's almost like photorealistic closer to realism um, it's just it doesn't it doesn't feel right you know it's too much it's too noisy it doesn't feel like gamey it's not that same kind of uh, kind of splash art so I need to I need to know how do I make it look like it's this wood texture, um, but it's exaggerated, right? It's it's lighthearted and it's not fully realistic, but it's what people would imagine wood would look like without looking at it, you know? So um, the worst thing is having someone look at a texture that you painted and say like, well, that doesn't look like, you know, that doesn't look like metal or that doesn't look like plastic or, or whatever. Um, and so you wanna make sure that it looks like the material without looking too much like the actual material. So it's a tough, tough balance to find when working on this stylization. So this was a, a part that I really liked. I really like rendering like this um, in that uh, I don't need to worry about the shadow uh, or the dark side as, as much um, in that I can just work with this big, you know, flat, uh, dark color. Um, I think I used like a dark blue or purple for a lot of those shadows on the inner, uh, inside of the, uh, tree monster or on the under, underside planes of them. Um, and I like working that way because, you know, it's, I, it's, it's a great way of, uh, implying detail without having to actually paint detail within the shadows. Um, I love being able to do that anytime. And as long as I can pull it off, I think it's, uh, I think it's really cool. Um, so you can see, yeah, I'm dropping this like big, deep purplish blue down there. Uh, and the reason I do that is because when I'm working on, on things, um, this is something I developed, uh, I shouldn't say develop, it's something that a lot of artists do. And I just was, <laughs> I was slow to it, um, is, uh, I, I started thinking a lot more about color temperature and, uh, I, I need to consider like what the color temperatures are. Um, in any given situation and I think the way I, I personally handle color temperature the way it's you know it's traditionally handled is that if you have a warm light um, then you will have a cool shadow and if you have a cool light you will have a warm shadow um, uh, and uh, I, I try to take that a little bit further in that every every new shift that happens within a form i try to have some sort of a color temperature not every shift is in going from a highlight to a uh, center light to a half tone but um these planes are shifting in a way that there's a cool light hitting the top of this uh tree monster but then the planes shift and face towards us a little bit where i'm imagining there'd be some sort of a fill light in there and I think that would be warm. That would be from the ambience, right? So there's a solid light source of cool light, and then there's this ambient light source all around of warm light. And therefore, in order to contrast that, the ambient occlusion would be a cool color. And so I have, you know, this desaturated uh, grayish brown um, or grayish orange for the cool light. And then I go to this warmer brown, and then I go to this uh, just absolute full saturated uh, purplish blue. And that way it will really pop all the warms uh, in the character, I think, and, and really solidify those, those plane changes with uh, just color alone. Um, and you can see I'm doing the same thing here on the sides. Uh, I love working like this where uh, there's these nice, thick, solid chunks of planes that are changing um, on the edges of that tree, and uh, love love working that way. I actually, I I think I work more that way now um, too than than back back when I worked on this, um, where I drop in just really solid blocks of value and color 
um, and uh, really, really try to hone in on, on the plane changes. Um, and if you're not uh, sure what I'm talking about here when I'm talking about uh, color temperature and plane changes and all that, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, uh, I have a, a, a tutorial series that I came out with. Um, I'll probably talk about it uh, once or twice in this video. But uh, I, uh, I, I discuss all of these um, topics. I talk about um, planes. I talk about um, color temperature. I talk about composition, anatomy, perspective. Uh, every every um, topic and subtopic that goes into them, uh, I discuss. Um, and so I'm sorry if some of this is... is going over some people's heads. I hope you're still able to get a grasp of what I'm talking about. Yeah, so now at this point, I have most of the major uh, values blocked in. Um, and uh, and now I'm going in and I'm kind of refining, you know, so... Um, and the way I think about refining is I, I have to think about the planes, you know, what planes are uh, the top planes, what are mid uh, or side planes um, if there's side planes are there two side planes and is one catching a different light source than another is one darker or lighter than another and then what are the underside planes um, and is the underside planes catching any light so um, okay so this is me working on a study um, I try to do a couple of these per per image uh, so I did those compositional studies. Now this is a material study uh, for sure where I'm trying to figure out how can I paint this wood and this fire. Um, even if I feel like I am doing a pretty decent job at it um, in the image, I honestly think working on a study like this, just making yourself do a study, um, even if it doesn't feel like you're completely lost or it's totally necessary, um, it's just a really good way of kind of resetting your brain, um, just getting you to think about something else for a second, um, stepping away and, and forcing yourself to, uh, to paint differently, I think. When you paint from your imagination, you're, you're in total control, um, and you don't have anything to compare to other than reference, and even then, I'm not, personally, I'm not very good at looking at reference and being able to directly compare. I have to open something up and like really paint on it or try and paint from it for me to figure out if I'm anywhere close to like making it look just right um so yeah I uh I don't I don't have a timer up on the screen but I think this one was about 30 minutes or so that I set myself um and just trying to get yeah that uh that fire just right trying to see what that glow would be like through the wood um how to get that kind of broken up wood texture but keeping it um simple um i try to think when working on any study like this if uh if it would be more uh efficient for me to consider the colors or the values or the drawing there's always like a specific thing that I'm after. Um, and what's tricky is I think this one was, I mean, I, I, I know I thought about it, but I think what I ended up going with is I think I just considered it to be a, uh, a render study in that um, it doesn't just come down to values uh, or colors. Um, it comes down to, to you know, whatever I can notice basically is that if I don't know what I'm uh, doing wrong about my own, you know, wood texture that I'm painting uh, or fire that I'm painting, um, uh, then I can't, I can't just assume like, oh, well, it's the colors or it's the values or it's this or that. Um, so instead, I'm as much as uh, I, I prefer to only think about one specific subject matter, whether it's colors or values. Um, I, uh, I will sometimes do this in that I have to think about multiple things. I'm thinking about values, I'm thinking about colors, I'm thinking about all of it at the same time. Um, 
which I think is a, it's a slower process um, and it's harder to get an accurate representation of what you're working on unless you're just very, uh, unless you do this a lot. Um, but uh, that way I can, I can really figure out like what, what is it that I um, need to adjust in my image. And so here you can see like on that edge there, I'm, I'm getting some of that warm light from the fire, like hitting on, on the edge and kind of getting those cinders in between the bark. And I, I really liked that look. So I, I definitely add that in the final. Um, and then this broken texture, you know, look, I, I experimented with different brushes to get that, um, get that feel that I wanted, experimented with, um, you know, like how spaced apart should these um, value breakings be, you know, where the bark will go from this dark gray to a light gray. And what's the transition like from a, uh, a, a barkless part of the tree to one that is surrounded with bark. Um, these are some notes that I'm taking. I, I try to take notes on, um, on almost every study that I, that I work on, uh, just to, um, just to really, really hammer home the, uh, <clears throat> the hammer in the, the, the ideas, you know, everything that I'm learning, I need to, I need to make sure I retain it. Um, you know, the worst thing to have happen is I'll, uh, I'll do a study of something and then all of a sudden, you know, oh, I gotta, I gotta go do this thing. I have this errand. I have to run. I have to step out of the apartment for, uh, for a little while. And then I come back and I can't really remember what I just learned from that study. Um, so I always try and do a study where I know I'll have time afterwards to apply it as, as quickly as possible. But I also write notes so that if I want, I can then open back up the file, look at my notes and go, oh, okay, that's right. Yeah, so blocking in some of these large chunky shapes, trying to kind of dig forms out of the wood, um, make it a little bit more interesting. Um, <clears throat> the important thing is to maintain those planes that I already was thinking about, was considering, um, which they aren't, I mean, they aren't perfectly laid in. Um, there's, there's some side planes that I've got that like, I think are lighter than other ones and it can, yeah, look, look off. If you want to see like a perfect example of, um, planes i think uh jihun lee is his his work is like nuts <laughs> his work i think i remember i ended up showing it to a friend of mine and he just was fully convinced that it was 3d models because um his values are, are placed so well but i think what really sells his values um are just the the subtle, accurate um, depictions of of planes, um, and how uh, how the lighting is caught on specific ones, uh, and and the fall off of lighting too. Um, it's just such a hard thing to to capture, uh, and he does a he does a great job at it. Um, and so. Uh, yeah, so my my plans are are not anywhere as accurate as that, um, and I think that's where like you you really start um, noticing how something doesn't look quite right, right? Like anyone could look at this and say like it's realistic enough, but when it really, really looks realistic, it's that perfect combination I think of of accurate drawing with incredibly accurate um or precise i should say i'll say precise uh plane changes yeah when you get that lighting just right um it uh it looks great it looks really great um i'm doing a lot of like fake lighting in mine um so you can see on that metal metal portion 
uh, I have technically three light sources when I'm actually only uh, attempting to depict two in most other cases. Um, I'm okay with that. Like, I think, I think fake lighting can, can be fine. It can be fun. Um, make something like pop and look cool and then go for it. Um, you can see I'm still, still even this, this late into the image, I'm still comparing it to the thumbnail stage. Um, cause I just think it's so important. You know, the, the more, especially the more that you get into this detailed stage, you lose so much of that simplicity. Right. Um, and I think it's, it's so important to keep that simplicity even within the final image. Um, it's, it, you know, it, if it gets too complicated, if it gets too, if there's too much rendering going on, which creates too much noise, um, it's just, it, you know, it's, it's so much to look at. And I think it's just so jarring for anyone that's the first, you know, they're just looking at your image for the first time. Um, and it's just too much information for anyone to kind of pick up all at, all at once. So I always try and keep things very simple. Um, keep silhouettes bold, um, keep the, uh, values nice and, and separated, um, or uh, separated and or grouped with, uh, complementary values. Um, so, you know, you can have a mid-tone and, and dark value together and, uh, you know, they'll, they'll fit in all right, but have a little bit of contrast, but then you... If you have those two and this nice combination of, of shapes, then you have this nice light um, object that just pops from the two of those. Like that, that to me, I think um, is where you get some nice value contrast. So yeah, just still applying what I learned from that study, really trying to not get an ultra realistic wood texture, but um, just doing what I think is enough for people to get that this is charred wood. You know, this is some wood that is on fire. <laughs> um, and you can notice, like, I didn't do studies of, you know, I didn't do studies of the leather gloves, of the, this guy's outfit, of the metal. Um, and it's just because... I, I felt confident enough working on that stuff. I've done a lot, a lot, a lot of studies of leather. <laughs> um, uh, I think, you know, working in the tabletop uh, game industry for long enough, leather, uh, metal, and cloth are some of the biggest things that you will ever need to learn how to paint. Um, they're like the three pinnacle materials. Um, and then beyond that, it starts getting into uh, more specific materials like, you know, like wood or plastic or, or whatever. And then the ultra materials, which are uh, versions of those three, the, the cloth, leather, metal, but done differently, right? So chrome is similar to metal, but it's this ultra metal, you know, and, um, and you're going to get like rough leather, padded leather, you're going to get satin cloth or silk like you know there's so many different nuances to different materials to get um if i were to just give some like quick one-off advice on it and i think it's it's uh if anyone disagrees feel free to let me know i'm sure there will be people that disagree but personally i think that um when rendering materials if you just really 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 focus on the highlight and the reflected light those are the things you got to pay attention to every material um it it changes drastically depending on how how those two lights are shown because those are the only two lights in a form that are a reflection of what we see instead of something that is being uh absorbed i, I suppose So yeah, just detailing this guy out, making sure he's nice and nice and rendered. 
Um, it's not often that I would work on a on a smite image and uh, they'd come back and say that you know needed needed tighter rendering. Uh, it was usually something they were pretty happy with. Um, even down to the little you know little sewing in the in the shoes there. Um, so in total, I think I, I, I think at this point I'd probably sent off the last update to the client. Um, so it would have been a, uh, the amount of updates that I send the client, I try to send them, um, I, I, I try to send updates to the client, uh, pretty consistently throughout the process. So what I'll usually do is, um, I will do a thumbnail, color thumbnail, then I go to lines, then I go to a flat color and light block in. Um, so I'll take uh, what I, you know, consider to be the um, flats of the colors and where the direction of the light's coming from. Um, and I'll kind of send that to them. Uh, I don't think I sent that to them this time. I think what I did instead is I just copy pasted the uh, color thumb colors and then kind of did some rendering on top um, and just went ahead and sent them the next step that I usually send which is a uh, I send a uh, render check-in about halfway through working on the image um, and then uh, finally I send them the final and I say you know I tell them this is my proposal for final if they have any feedback to let me know now the reason I do that is because it's uh, that was a um, trial and error <laughs> sort of a uh, process to develop um just because of the amount of clients that would end up giving me feedback at terrible terrible places in uh in the image you know you you don't want to get uh you don't want to get feedback on your drawing as you're sending in your final render right if if, if that ever happens I, I do believe that 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 is on the the art director for not noticing that initially and it's like I said it's difficult it's very difficult to to notice some issues with a drawing um, without there being proper forms in place but that's why in between the drawing stage and the final render stage I send two additional updates right so hopefully at that point the uh the art director will notice uh drawing stages and i've had to tell clients this in the past before you know i think i did i did have a couple instances uh where this happened with um with smite while working with them in the past and it just happens you know i, I don't i don't give them you know i'm not i'm not trying to give them too much grief i understand that like sometimes you don't notice something until later on it 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 just absolutely happens that way um however this process is done to to try and avoid those mishaps, to try and streamline everything as best as possible. Um, it's best to get feedback on the drawing when you're working on the drawing, you know? It's best to get feedback on, um, on values when, uh, when you have the color and light uh, uh, blocked in, or when you, even early on when you have the, uh, when you have the thumbnail blocked in. So still uh, rendering it all out, all the rendering, I still try and consider the planes, try and consider the uh, where the light is catching. Um, try and consider the values too, and that, you know, even if realistically, maybe parts of this wood would be brighter than they actually are. Uh, I don't, I cannot risk having anything take attention away from the focus of this image, which is you know, primarily the, uh, the character and the tree monster. So just getting some of that implied detail in there. Um, trying to, uh, pizzazz it all up, you know, make it, make it look nice. Um, and that can be the issue with working on some of this splash art is that it's very, uh, it's very difficult to know when enough is enough. You know, when is, when is it rendered enough? Um, Partially, I think it's up to the client, and I think it's uh, it's really learning what the client uh, likes. You know, it's learning what uh, what it's like to work with this client, what they what they enjoy, and it can take a long time to to establish that. You know, 
you can be a you can be a generally good artist um you know where you anyone could look at your work and say yeah you could you could work for you know most most clients if not all clients basically um but uh but it's still a huge learning curve to work with specific clients you know they're going to have their own process way of doing things um and it's it's kind of um in a sense it's kind of your job as a freelancer uh to uh to streamline that to make sure that you know that they're happy but that you're still staying sane you know you don't want to bend your back completely um so that uh these people can you know take advantage of of you and your time and the fact that you are um working from home more than likely um but uh you want to make sure that uh you know they that they're getting the product that they uh that they want in the in the amount of time that they want it yeah and this is this is the part that it gets tough you know where where do you decide how much is enough um and uh especially when it comes to textures like this right this guy's made entirely of wood <laughs> like i could detail it forever um and i think i just decided that you know once the uh once the focal point is uh, rendered and then everything else has enough implied rendering where like if I just glance at it, I get an idea of, like, yeah, that, you know, that's wood. That looks wooden. Um, it looks like where it looks kind of like everything got a little a little touch of love. I don't know how else to say that. I don't want to sound too, too Bob Rossi, but like I guess that's how I really feel is like it has to look like you you paid a little bit of attention to it you know can't just let it go by and so uh but it, for me you know especially with working on freelance things if a freelance job isn't going the way that you wanted if uh if the client's pushing back or they keep giving you adjustments that you don't agree with um you just you have to find some like you have to find something something to keep yourself going um because otherwise you'll get in this deep hole of you know blaming it all on the client getting upset at the client and uh you can you can say you know the client doesn't know what they are doing you can you can complain all you want but at the end of the day you are a commercial artist this is your job it doesn't matter if you think that you know better um, it doesn't matter if the client wants something that you think looks bad. Um, one, chances are it's not actually as bad as you think it is. Most work that I remember getting some feedback there that I that I thought like was awful. I uh, I went and looked back a year later and I was like, eh, it's, it's not terrible. <laughs> it's, not, it's not that bad. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's I mean it's it's our job. That's that's what you do as a commercial artist. You know, you cannot be upset because they did not like your idea. <laughs> you agreed to this payment. You agreed to the job. Now, there's some circumstances that, yes, they can get over the top. They can get ridiculous. A client has you, you know, doing 20 revisions on one image for a flat fee. Like, yeah, that's the, you know, pull, pull the plug. Tell them negotiate. Have some compromise. Like, definitely stick up for yourself at that point. But... I mean, there's there's too many times I've met artists that, you know, they'll get one thing of feedback and just boom, mm, they're set off. Like, no, this client sucks. They don't know what they're doing. It's ridiculous. Why would they want this? I've been there. You know, I I'm not any better. I've definitely done that. You know, there's a there there's always you know something that you're passionate about that then there gets to be a little bit of pushback and you disagree with it. It's just something that happens. But you know, we. Uh, that's that's the job if you don't like it then maybe you know maybe being a commercial artist isn't for you you could still like art but maybe you just prefer working on stuff for yourself and that's totally fine so that's uh that's kind of the end of the tutorial this is the final image um like i said there's things that i would do differently uh now but that would this was a very accurate look at what an average smite piece was like for me it was um same exact process for the most part. I very rarely change it. Um, 
wanted to give you guys just some insights on like how I handle working with clients, um, how I handle general image making or illustrations, how it differs between clients, etc. Um, so uh, thank you all for, you know, hanging out, listen to me ramble, watch this image, you know, slowly build up and, and develop. And I want to try and give uh, my YouTube channel here a little bit more attention. Um, I don't want just all of my, you know, newest tutorials to be going on to Gumroad. Uh, I'm, I am probably going to come out with another couple of uh, paid tutorials this year where uh, it'll be a similar fashion to this, but I think I'll, I want to go into a little bit more specific detail uh, into uh, my, my thought process um, and how I, how I handle uh, making the image instead of just a, just a, a voice recording uh, like this. I want to take a little bit deeper of a dive um, and uh, maybe go over some, some new insights uh, since the creation of this image. So, um, so look forward to that. And I, uh, I have some ideas on uh, some, fun, some fun YouTube videos moving forward as well. So uh, thank you all so much for uh, watching um, the first episode of the beginner's guide. Thank you everyone for watching this video um, and everyone that's been supporting me on Twitch and I mean everywhere else. It's just, it's, uh, it's been a crazy, crazy last few years uh, to imagine I could do, um, do art for a living and that I can share some of my insights with, uh, with everyone else. So I uh, really appreciate it and I'll talk to you later. Okay, bye.